This episode contains coarse language. Discretion is advised. Welcome to another episode of Tech Society with your hosts, tech entrepreneurs and software pioneers, John Newham and Alex Dunmo. Welcome to another episode of Tech Society. You're with John. And Alex. And today we'll be talking about something that we come across a lot, but we don't even realize. It's, uh, and it's use a, a lot. Yes. It's uh, buzzwords in our industry, the tech industry. And a bit of a crossover between tech, pure tech, and tech business. I think there's, a lot of, there's a lot of buzzwords on either side. Yeah, especially in this startup space. Uh, a lot of people like to use acronyms and you know, cool cool tech words so we've got we've got a list of tech buzzwords here and the first one in our list is full stack you want to cover this one john yeah so to to the typical person uh non-techy person a full stack developer is something they often ask for of course a full stack developer is someone who does the full stack and a a technology stack is in a tech business uh, the pieces of software that is put together to create the product Hmm. so things like so a full stack consists of uh, you know, front end, back end, you know, operations, database, uh, database guy, DevOps guy. So like yeah. a jack of all trades, master of none thing. So full stack is the is a guy who can technically do it all, right? That's right. Even you know, all the way through to deployments, testing. This role is very attractive to a startup because they they think they can mold you know mesh everything into one, cover every responsibility and domain. I think I I personally feel that most devs should be able to to be full stack not necessarily ex- experts but they should be able to work on the back end code well, they should be able to work on the front end code they the, should be able to deploy it the term is t- t-shaped developer where they every developer has a specialty you know front end specialty back end specialty deployment specialty like specialties but they can do everything if they need to so by default, that's how we operate at Ninja Software. Yeah. I mean, people have their specialties. Yeah, but, but we expect but everyone to know enough to do things. Know enough to be dangerous. So that's what we considered full stack developers. Actually, yeah. no, that's what we consider to be a developer. Yes, that's right. If, if you only know one side of this equation, then I question whether you've ever built your own software, which I, if for us is a bit of a requirement. So I think we should cover <laughs> the buzzwords that we covered in this buzzword, front end and back end. Okay. So people have used this incorrectly a few times because of the, the way WordPress operates. A front end developer is someone who handles things that happen on the front end, and that's not very helpful, I know, but it's basically what the user sees in their browser. So user facing. User facing application. And most people think of it as from a web application perspective, right? Yeah. But it, it technically can include mobile apps the thing that you see desktop apps yeah, yeah. the thing that you see as a user so uh, a front end developer covers that however like all apps today they actually communicate with a central repository of information in our case it's the back end so a back end developer covers things that sit i guess today in the cloud so the servers you know testing all the algorithms and also connections to the database. So not the administration console of an app. That's right. So in WordPress, you go to slash WP dash admin. Mm-hmm. It'll take you to the admin portal. Some people call this the back end, but what you're yeah. saying is that's not right. That's right. It's not the back end. So, yeah. <laughs> so the admin portal consists of a front end, which is what you see as an admin. And it consists of the back end, which is actually where all the information is stored on the server. So there's a couple of buzzwords in the front end world. You've got UI or user interface, yep. which essentially is the front end, the user interface. And you have UX, which actually means user experience. So what's the difference? So user experience is uh, a bit more ephemeral. It's a, it's a feeling more than it is a, an actual functional thing. It's, it's how does your users actually feel when using your user interface? I think it's like how you go... the. The process in which you go from one screen to the next, you know, for example. But it is definitely more focused around the emotions and attitudes your users have 
about actually using your product or system. Yeah. Uh, UX is super important. And I would say most devs are not very good at it. And it probably sits more in the design world. Although anyone who's even a little bit associated with the building of software should be thinking about user experience. So UI covers uh, user interface, so which is, again, what you see. Mm-hmm. There's a there's a term called GUI or GUI, which is a good one. Yeah. So that's <laughs> this buzz was just coming out the wazoo. GUI is the UI in the web world. It's what the designers design. Mm-hmm. It's what the front end developers create for you to use. So graphical user interface. I think a lot of people just say UI these days, but graphical user interface is definitely more descriptive. I think we actually had a customer send us an email where they wrote GUI as in G-O-O-E-Y. That's right. Which I, I, I've always <laughs> held on to that. It was very funny. <laughs> but it also informs this episode. It's, it's spelled G-U-I and it yeah. stands for graphical user interface. That's right. And it represents the user interface that you, the user, would use regardless of where you are on the platform, admin, guests, you know, user, you will see a GUI. So the, the distinction between UI and GUI is all GUIs are examples of UI, but not all examples of UI are GUIs. So a text message to your phone that requires an action from you, that is technically user interface. That's right. So user interface is all about communications between the system or the product and the person, not necessarily graphical, mostly graphical, definitely. And most people, when they say UI, they mean they they are talking about a GUI. Mm Mm-hmm but not technically, whereas GUI is always the screen in front of you. All right, so next we have a concept that's quite recent. It's called DevOps. So it's a portmanteau of developer and operations. So traditionally you'd have SysOps, system operations. And yeah, the system um, administrator, right? Yeah, so like, like you know, to, yeah. helping out the users of the organization. But now you have DevOps, which is a person dedicated to helping the developers of the organization. Usually their focus is putting in automation and tooling that shortens the shortens the development life cycle, increases the the output of the devs, right? Yeah, so (laughs) as all devs like to think, they're actually a unique special bunch (laughs) and they require specialized tools and specialized treatment. And generally then like as your standard dev doesn't enjoy actually administering servers and systems and and, and doing IT type things, right? It's just, to them, it's busy work. It's manual labor. They're they're doing all this automatic stuff. They're pushing their their code. Why do they need to do anything else after that? It's like architect versus bricklayer. Mm. Yeah. So the DevOps guy kind of automates the whole process so that the developer can just focus on his thing, which is making code. So... DevOps generally focuses on continuous delivery, which means like automatic deployments. Automatic deployments, yeah. So, so the programmer will blah blah blah, type 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 type. He will submit his code or commit and push his code, and then the system that the DevOps guy has put into place will automatically deploy that to the server, mobile app, or wherever the target is. So this is related to the next buzzword: site reliability engineer or SRE. We won't cut. <laughs> we won't touch into this one too much, but it's, it's a mouthful. Yeah, SREs. It's basically a DevOps dev engineer who makes sure makes sure everything runs very well. So things like A/B testing, green, blue green deployments, you know, all the automatic deployment stuff. It's like really, really hardcore stuff, and it's really become popular since the cloud platforms like AWS has come out. Mm. And ultimately, it's making sure everything's running very well and because your your downtime is so catastrophic to your business so triple entry accounting is the natural evolution of double entry accounting Mm -hmm. so double entry accounting is basically inputs and outputs of a of a platform so you have to reconcile your transactions as every business knows and that's that's and then there needs to be on the other side in the other business a matching transaction so like when I invoice a, a company and they pay, yeah, it's then, matching. Yeah, so they have they have the invoice coming in and their payment going out. I have the invoice going out and the payment coming in. Yeah, right? and, and okay. no, so you have the invoice going out and they have the payment going out. So yeah, two two organizations have the same entry. That's double entry. So I'm not an accountant, so don't hold me to that. But that's what auditors look at, 
right? So mm-hmm. auditors look at the move, the flow of money between organizations. Making sure it all matches. Yeah, which is yeah. why when there's like layers and layers and layers of shell companies, it's a bit trickier. Triple entry accounting is that, but that transaction has been cryptographically signed and fingerprinted. So you can mm-hmm. actually check that, you can confirm that that actually happened. So it's like a layer above double entry accounting that actually verifies that that transaction happened. Now, blockchain is that, but decentralized. So decentralized basically means that- Ooh, another buzzword. <laughs> <laughs> so decentralized refers to- uh, No central authority. Yeah, and, and the, the store of truth is spread out across different nodes. And the trust is, the trust is implicit in a quorum. So that's right. If you know a certain percentage of, of all the nodes out there with the data agree on the data, then that data is the truth. Yeah, so that's the over 50%, 51% and above majority rules in terms of the source of truth. So that's blockchain. It's a decentralized triple entry accounting system. I, I, I love blockchain, Bitcoin, Ethereum. Idealist, I'm an idealist about it, but let's, let's, let's not dwell on this one. All right, let's go to another fun one. AI or artificial intelligence. This is huge. There's been buzzwords that have actually, we've got it down the list here, but over the years, there's been tech buzzwords that have taken over the industry. And today it's AI. AI stands for artificial intelligence in yeah. case you haven't uh, picked that up. So artificial intelligence. Now people will think of movies like AI and, and Terminator as the obvious one, but artificial intelligence at this point in time really me, like merely, merely refers to the possibility for machines to actually learn from experience rather now, than being programmed. The problem is that sounds scary. Machines yeah. are learning. So that's actually one of the ones is, you know, ML, which is machine learning as well. Well, I think uh, I heard someone describe AI versus machine learning or as artificial as an artificial intelligence is the concept machine learning is it in effect. So the that's application. When you, yeah, it's when you've actually solved it. Like your machine, your machine is learning. It's machine learning. <laughs> but that's the problem because it's such a loaded term, learning intelligence, you know. When AI is so heavy. Like, it's such a heavy concept in sci-fi. You know, you've got Asimov and, yeah, yeah. and Terminator. But if you, if you actually dig into it, so I did the, the big course with Andrew in, a while back. AI is actually the just a form of computational statistics. So if you were very good at linear algebra, I know I wasn't, but I got better in matrix, matrix, you know, matrix based mathematics. AI is, is like that, but with a huge data set dimensions, dimensions. Oh, vectors. Yeah. Yeah. AI ML is, is computational statistics on, on a huge scale involving lots of data, a very complex model with, with weighting and stuff and being able to provide an output. So there's, you know, there's, there's many types of machine learning. Which what it, I, we've talked about in previous episodes. Yeah. So if you really want to learn more about AI, probably go back to our episode with Toby Walsh or Keith McCormick. Yeah. Yeah. But what it, what it does is it takes an input and gives you an output. That, yeah. That's what it does. And, and that input to output algorithm is trained based on data. And that's the learning part. Well, I reckon right now that's still just a really fun sci-fi concept. We're not close to that as far as I'm aware. Maybe there's something going on at DARPA, but you know, <laughs> I'm not aware of it. It's, I it's, don't think we're that close to it. It's not even related. The, the things that people do in machine learning today is nothing to do with general AI. No, it's not. It's, it basically, I mean, in fact, AI machine learning have existed for a very long time. We just now have the parallel processing to make it worthwhile. Let's, let's jump forward to the next one. Ooh, the next one on the list definitely is relevant to AI and machine learning. Big data. Big data. So what is big data? Big data is a data set that is very large yep. and we're talking big. Like Google big. Yeah, not, not petabytes, uh, not gigabytes. N- not your big Excel sheet. Uh, we're talking, yeah. we're talking data that does not sit in your memory. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the data does not sit in your PC's memory. Yeah, or even your gigantic server's memory is right. huge. It's data that needs to be streamed, processed, chopped and sliced into a point where you can actually work with it. Yep. And it is great for training AI. It got really big, really popular years ago. You know, Spark Hadoop stages where Java and MapReduce was popular. Yep. This is probably about, I don't know, earlier this decade. We're currently in 2020, so earlier <laughs> near the 2010s. 
and uh, there was a push towards you know really processing big data and doing stuff with it but the doing stuff with it part has really only been possible with machine learning yeah and big data is definitely something only the big companies and big governments are really really capable of in all honesty which is a shame but da- data is fun and yeah but you know you gotta be able to pick up the data you gotta be able to collect it not for most businesses unfortunately so the next one is on the same same principle data mining so what is data mining we're talking pickaxes or what (laughs) maybe metaphorically data mining is really simple it's actually just a collection of data over the internet or i think it's just everything isn't it yeah and i think data mining is also referred to actually going through already collected data to try and find that valuable data we talked about with big data so that that can be seen as data mining so you've got that data collection data mining is when you're actually digging through it trying to find the gold what i enjoy is the next buzzword data munging nice which is apparently 90 percent of a data scientist's job is to clean up messy data that's come into the system spend a lot of time uh, removing empty values creating values that cleaning up values that are there that are wrong in a large scale so there's a lot of a lot of scripting involved to do your data munging after which you can do your data mining after which you could then apply your ML. And that's basically a data scientist in a nutshell. Yes. <laughs> All right, next one. Net neutrality. This one's been in the news recently over the last few years. Yeah, very US specific, I feel. Yeah, well, I mean, it does apply to us here in Australia. I think any, anything just US scale is always bigger and gets more press. Yep. But net neutrality, to put it very simply is a principle that internet service providers must treat all communications equally, which means they can't prioritize their own communications. So a great example is Comcast in America. They run, they have their own streaming service, competes head on with Netflix, but they also provide internet connections to people. Now, I'm not saying it was proven, but it's definitely been alleged that they prioritize their own services traffic, internet traffic, over Netflix's. That's an example of Comcast not being neutral with their traffic. So net neutrality is a good thing. Yeah, I think so. I just feel that the term is so vague that people don't know. Yeah, they don't understand it. They don't don't know if they're going for net neutrality or, or against it because it's not clear what neutrality actually means. So net neutrality is absolutely a good thing, especially for small businesses that can't afford to pay ISPs to to prioritize their traffic. You know, as a, as a business, you don't want to have to pay every single ISP in Australia just to make sure your customers can actually reach your website and view it, you know, in an enjoyable way. So yeah, net neutrality in a nutshell. Before we continue this podcast, here's a message from our sponsor. We believe that you can create art and beauty with technology. We think big. We move quietly. We are ninja software. All right, cool. Next we have chatbots. So chatbots have been around for a while. I think you find that in the 90s, chatbots were very popular on the year old IRC. So I actually wrote a chatbot for Merck. <laughs> he was called Bok Bok. And Bok Bok would join a channel and he would just go in listening mode. So he would he would collect the like, sentences, uh, messages written by the people in the chat channel. And he would store them based on a keyword. So that I wrote an algorithm to pick the, the keyword from that sentence. And that, that, then that message would be stored under that keyword. Later, I would turn Bok Bok into talk mode. And then he would essentially you know, use that same keyword algorithm to grab the keyword from a sentence and then pull from his database of messages and just respond to it. Generally, Bok Bok would get in fights <laughs> and people would tell Bok Bok to go fuck himself quite a lot. Bok Bok was a lot of fun. I saw a, definitely a, it was, it was far more complex than Bok Bok, but you had the Microsoft Twitter chatbot who turned into a Nazi. I saw a lot of analogies there. Tay, uh, this, the bot was called Tay AI. That's T-A-Y. right. Yep. And this AI was unleashed on Twitter only to be trained by Twitter. <laughs> it was just a horrible, horrible thought. Yeah. I don't know who came up with the idea. <laughs> Someone at Microsoft thought it was. It was Masochists. They, they probably just said to themselves, oh, you know, this is a great data set to train Tay on. 
you know, it's, it's but, the voice but, of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out the world is uh, is a bit of a cesspool full of trolls and Nazis. But from a business perspective, chatbots are used quite a lot in support. Yep. To you know, just just chat to 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 an algorithm, I guess. When you want to, instead of filling out forms, you can answer things. To simplify it, there's two kinds of chatbots, right? You have the the one that's trained on trained with AI, as we talked about before, who who responds in a almost more organic way, and you may not even know or realize that you're talking to a chatbot AI. Yeah, and I think the second one would be the the decision tree type. D- yeah, exactly. Where they ask you something, you answer something, and they ask you the next canned res- canned question. Yeah, often you don't even type a response; you just press a button. Uh, it's it's actually a form yeah in the chat it, system yeah so ultimately forms are very linear so you you answer the form you go to the next page you answer that the chatbots kind of like a tree shape where you know based on what you answer they ask you different things this is unfortunately sold as ai chatbots a lot these days yeah it is not it is not hopefully after listening to this episode it is obvious that it is not to you as well and anyone who sells you on the whole AI chatbot approach, mm. two things to take keep in mind is that does does a fuzzily fuzzily trained artificial intelligence really provide the support to your customers that you need? And if not, and the chatbot uses a decision tree, it's not AI. That's yeah, uh, absolutely. I I think the AI trained chatbots have a lot of promise and maybe the bigger companies can successfully train their AI based off all their support records, but I'm I'm dubious. I'm dubious. And I know that when I detect that I'm speaking to a chatbot, an AI AI trained chatbot, I I, I, just, it's not going to solve my problem generally. And and I think basically an AI trained chatbot is not going to solve a customer's problem unless that customer's problem can be solved by actually just reading the frequently asked questions. On a related note, we have a internal chatbot here at Ninja Software. So just, to, you know, just quickly to deal with lockdown, you know, issues with mental health and the concerns about employees well-being. I created a chatbot hmm. and this chatbot wasn't super smart. It was like a decision tree, but it would actually on schedule ping the every single employee once at 9.15 a.m., once at 4.45 p.m., and just ask what they're doing, how they're going, if they're happy or not, and, you know, any any kind of anonymous feedback they had for the leadership, which was us. Hmm. So that's a good example of a chatbot that has been built for a specific purpose and does not pretend to be an artificial intelligence. Hmm. It's just a touch point that is scheduled and, and it's actually worked really well for us and it's easier to use than a web form right i mean we totally could have written or you sorry you totally could have written a an email that went out linked to a web form and they filled in the web form right but we actually tried that no one did it yeah (laughs) no one does it everyone hates forms i don't know why it's even it's just easier in a a chat system but it's you're writing all the same information right yeah but there's prompts constant prompts yeah and and you're in a chat app, yeah. your <laughs> cursor is already in the chat box. You just type the thing and press enter. You press enter and then the bot's like, oh, what are you doing today? And yeah. it's, oh, cool, thanks. Uh, so, you know, any issues that you have? It's such a such a back and forth that even with just a decision tree, autom- like an automatic chatbot, uh, it's, it's, really, it's really helped for us find out what's going on and have a pulse on the business. Yeah, and people don't seem that phased about actually responding to it, which you know in comparison to the web form which no one did (laughs) completely different yeah exactly so that's chatbots let's move on to the next one all right so then we combined these two i don't know if you want to talk about them separately but we've got augmented and virtual reality i believe uh so ar and vr right yes so there is a term that combines them both it's called xr (laughs) across reality of course a buzzword we don't even have in the list so augmented virtual and cross so reality cross reality is a umbrella term for anything i guess you put on your head and you see different things yeah that's, that's, that's what i'd call it yeah so augmented reality is becoming more popular pokemon go made it real famous so, so you hold up your phone you see stuff the camera points at something 
and then the phone draws in some virtual reality, basically. Yeah, but the, the real world is still there. Yeah. Yeah, so that's augmented reality. Uh, uh, Pokemon Go is a great example. Another example oh, yeah. that um, I played with recently is Sphero. He's a little mini robot ball, programmable robot ball. And there's some games. So you, you hold up your camera. Sphero is on the ground. You control him with your phone. You hold up your phone and the, and it draws in zombies. And you have to like run over the zombies in your lounge room with Sphero. So it's a lot of fun. It's pretty cool. And the in- industry level extreme AR example is the hololens yes so, microsoft hololens which is actually available to corporates mm. and uh, corporations sorry and uh, it's it's like virtual reality goggles that you just chuck on your head but you see stuff and it detects what you're looking at it it overlays things it's very good for you know working in the field uh, lots of it's a quite it's quite cutting edge technology the demo reel we've seen from microsoft is the closest i would say to science fiction that I've seen that's technically in effect. I've never actually seen a real world use that's made me go, wow. But the demo reel, you know, you, you've got that example where the woman needs to diagnose some electrical panel, right? And she puts the goggles on and it connects to the support center and the, the woman in the support center is just wearing a headset and she is able to overlay help to this to the person on the field to actually diagnose the electrical panels wow that is cool it is cool but it was a demo reel and i I look forward to trying it in real life so on on that uh, we have virtual reality it's it's where you you've probably seen it it's available to consumers lawnmower man right (laughs) not quite it's more like it's not even like ready player one we're not quite there yet no but they're goggles that you put on your head and then you can look around, you can walk around, you can interact with the virtual environment and you don't see the real world at all yeah, in the you, lens. You're in a new 3D world that kind of feels real. Yeah, and Kinda. it's... So, so some people who said they've tried it on the Google Cardboard, it is not the same <laughs> at all. Yeah. For some who have only used the PSVR, it's similar, but... It's almost there, but not yeah. very... F- I, I, so I, I got the PSVR and there's some really fun games in there and... It's definitely a great intro into VR, but if, if that's your only experience with VR, it's pretty underwhelming. It, the quality is not amazing. Yeah, not just the quality, uh, it's also the way you interact. So, um, you know, Valve in Steam VR made it all popular with what's called room scale. So, where you can actually interact, walk around the room and walk over to something and interact with something. So you just recently bought a VR headset that I was very impressed with. And, and it's actually the first time where I've gone, wow, you know, VR is so close to mainstream. Yeah, this is the Oculus Quest 2 by Facebook. And the, the tracking is great. And there's no there's no hardware you have to install into the walls or anything. Oh. It just, just works. And then it actually built in has the ability to play wireless VR as well. So you can actually, you can actually stream pretty much lag-free high resolution vr from your pc to your quest 2 if you just put this on you you do realize that it's, it just it just changes everything you like this yeah. is the next level platform yeah all right the next one i don't feel smart enough <laughs> to actually talk to but I, I feel like it is a buzzword we just keep hearing uh, quantum computing a quantum computer is a model of how to build a computer the idea is that quantum computers can use certain phenomena from quantum mechanics such as superposition and entanglement to perform operations on data. It's not that simple. It's not very simple. Quantum computing is not simple. So I, I don't feel confident enough to really talk on it. I mean, like, so to talk about quantum computing, you have to talk about qubits, uh, quantum bits. I would talk about the the, yeah. <laughs> the implications of quantum computing, all right? Okay. So, so quantum computing, I think in a nutshell, you could do more at once. It's like parallel computing, but better. That's, that's what I'll say for now. But... Quantum computing introduces the ability to crack encryption because encryption is protected just by the virtue of taking so long to crack. Yeah. So if we if we nail quantum computing, we'll be able to undo standard cryptography a lot quicker, right? Which is catastrophic now to the internet. Yeah, and yeah. and anything the whole internet runs off you know SSL, which is um, secure encryption between servers and clients so banking yeah all the banking systems use it the first country that has a successful state sponsored quantum computing system will be able to crack the security of all the banks 
I think the assumption, and I think it's a safe one personally, is that by the time we have a quantum computer that is that functional, we will have developed quantum computing safe cryptography. Actually, it's already been done. So yeah, there's there's quantum there's, there's quantum resistant algorithms for, for encryption. Mm -hmm. But the next question is, how fast can the banks move in response to that? They haven't really shown themselves to move quickly. <laughs> so uh, I feel that there'll, maybe. Be, there'll be a catastrophic transition period <laughs> where, where a country has access to quantum computing and can do stuff. And then the banks, everyone would catch up eventually. And like a bad actor, a, a, yeah. a state that really has proven itself to maybe not be that trusting, trustworthy. Yeah. I, so, so what you're saying is that the bank, it'll take a catastrophic event for the banks to actually go, oh, we better put this in place. That's right. And uh, the catastrophic event will be someone that can just run around cracking all the banks, breaking in and stealing all their money. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next one. IOT or internet of things. I find this has become more popular lately. Yeah. I keep hearing about it too. So what is it? Essentially, it's... Essentially, it's devices that are not technically computers that have a computer in them and are connected to the internet. So like a toaster that connects to the internet and tells you when your toaster, your toast is ready. You know, that is the internet of things in a nutshell. So a smart device. Yeah, pretty much. It's also, it also describes like embedded sensors. So let's say a stadium with temperature sensors and environmental sensors around the stadium. And that, that's technically considered internet of things. Basically just like small devices connected to the internet yeah yeah pretty much iot it's also called yeah okay next i Digital. think just, this is the last one for this, is, yeah. this episode uh please continue so this one this one is one i'm actually sick of hearing about so yeah it's digital transformation tell me what is digital transformation blow my mind because <laughs> i've i've heard this one a lot so as if, if I was a uh, management consultant that would be selling you digital transformation, yes, I would say, what isn't digital transformation? <laughs> well, <laughs> I guess writing in notepads is not digital transformation. That's correct. <laughs> I can't speak much to this because, again, I'm not a management consultant in actually, the business of selling it. I disagree that you can't speak to this. I think actually Ninja Software is in the business of digital transformation. We just don't. We don't sell it like that. Well, yeah, we, we don't actually think that it's important to even even phrase like that. So the idea of digital transformation is you look at your business and you you adopt more technology to improve the business. That's digital transformation. But that's obvious, right? Yeah, so a lot of businesses, they've been operating for some of them longer than I've been alive. And with that kind of legacy, they've carried with them the old way of doing things yeah you know, filling out paperwork and well even spreadsheets can technically be considered something that can be digitally transformed so even though even though it's technically on a computer you've got a person putting in, in like data into a spreadsheet that person putting data into the spreadsheet is the manual process that can probably be automated and that is digital transformation is the automation of repeated busy work well yeah that's part of that's it part of it yeah, yeah it, it's basically just adopting technology and processes that improve your business digital transformation is the buzzword that explains that process it's absolutely something business owners should think about and government should think about the, i think the term itself is a bit meaningless like a sales term yeah because yeah. uh, I, I can run into a business and just say you know i will help you with your digital <laughs> transformation we're gonna transform you <laughs> But it, it it's, it's kind of meaningless. It's a umbrella term for everything that we do, yeah. Which is you know tech apps, you know cloud moving to the cloud, all, all the things. I love what the people who sell it like who sell it as a as a buzzword. I love how they use it. So here's an example. It's also a cultural change that requires organizations to continually challenge the status quo, experiment, and get comfortable with failure. <laughs> <laughs> digital transformation is the integration of digital technology into all areas of business bum, bum, bum. you know like that's digital transformation okay well <laughs> again see like it's not wrong it's not <laughs> i mean I'd, like they're right that that is digital transformation but I'm, I'm really sick of like that sales speak <laughs> well it doesn't blow my socks off and to our listeners hopefully uh, you appreciate that digital, digital transformation doesn't necessarily 
help. You need more specifics than that. And well, also identifying what the problem is in the first place. Yep. <laughs> I mean, I got, I got nothing to add to that. Yeah, I think we've covered it. Digital transformation. That was fun. Yeah, so that concludes this episode. We covered a myriad of buzzwords in the tech industry. Yep. We will continue using them. Yes. And we will continue expecting that you know what we mean. Or we'll just point you to this episode. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you for listening. That's it for me, Alex. And John. And on this day in tech history, December 16th, 2003, the Can Spam Act of 2003 is signed into United States law, passed in an attempt to control the growing deluge of junk email. The law has obviously worked as the internet is free of spam. Thank you, politicians. <laughs>